And it's my pleasure now to introduce Gibran Rivera. Gibran Rivera is an internationally renowned master facilitator. He helps the transformation of leaders, networks, and organizations. He develops our capacity to work with complexity, and he pays very close attention to dynamics of power, equity, and inclusion. Gibran invites us into what he calls a forward-facing remembering. He understands that our next evolutionary leap depends on trust and the currency of love, and he has devoted his life to defining better ways of being together in this world. Thank you. Welcome, Gibran. Thank you so much, Wendell, and welcome, everybody. Good to, good to be here with you. Um, I want to get us started with a practice, a very simple practice. I'm just going to invite you to notice what is in front of you. Pay some attention to your breath and just notice what's happening. Make no judgment of it. No assessment, just a simple noticing. And then I'm going to invite you to look over your left shoulder, but move your hip as you look over your left shoulder. Just return to center. And now look up and look down. Come back to center and look over your right shoulder. Move your hip when you do. And come back to center. And just notice how you're feeling now. What we did there is we just told our body that we're safe. We are, we have this biology, we're these biological embodied entities and our body has this wisdom and there's this way if you look over your left, you look up, you look down, you look to the right. And right now, for the time being, uh, you are okay. And it's good to know you're okay so that you can pay attention and so that you can be here and we can all be together. Notice what is actually happening. My name is Gibran and I thank Gwendolyn for the introduction and the team for the invitation. Uh, I wanna say a couple of things about how I come into this conversation on conscious masculinity. The first is that I, uh, I am a cisgender heterosexual male. Uh, and so that's the experience I speak from. That's what I know. That's, that's what I embody. And so today I'm going to talk about masculinity with the understanding that gender is a construct, that we are all on a spectrum. And I come up to this conversation believing and seeing that a number of us, a certain percentage of the population, is born into male bodies and identifies as masculine, right? And that's what I'm concerning myself with, again, because that is what I know best. So when I say, when I, when I speak about masculinity, that's the, that's the corner that I'm, that I'm interested in today. People that are born as male and that identify as masculine. And I'm very concerned with the role that we play uh, in the lack of safety of women and other people across the gender spectrum. And so I also wanna say that I come into this conversation uh, committing to men's work as the work of atonement, the work of atonement for harm caused. When I think about my worst moments as a human being on this earth, they have each had to do with patriarchy. When I brought most shame to myself, when I have a hurt uh, not only people around me, but my community, it has been because of patriarchy. And so I come into this work that way. I don't come into this work as somebody that, that is holy or perfect, but as somebody that is atoning for mistakes made, that wants to can make up for harm caused by doing good things in the world. That's an important thing to mention. I want to ask each of you if you can bring a boy to your mind, a boy, I'm going to say nine years old or younger, right? Nine years old or, young, or younger. Hopefully somebody that's around that age right now, but it doesn't have to be, right? It can be someone else that you knew, right? But just think about a boy and just kind of bring that person into your heart. And, and if you notice that boy is playful, right? 
That boy is energetic. That boy is born good, right? I mean, they might be mischievous as, at times, but that has nothing to do with the fact that they're a boy, right? There's just like a, a curiosity and a warm way of being. So if you can think about that, right? And then something seems to happen a couple of years from that that begins to shape and change the posture of that boy. And so we want to ask ourselves, what is it that happens? And I think there's two things that happen. One is they step into a cultural milieu. They step beyond, right, what might be a good and healthy family construct. Oftentimes it's not. And that boy is still happy, right? Or that boy can still find joy and playfulness. They step beyond that into a social milieu that is going to begin to define what masculinity should be to them. That's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens that we are often less comfortable talking about, and yet it is true, is that that boy, most of those boys are going to be flooded, right? They're going to be flooded with hormones during that time period. And a lot of that hormone is going to include testosterone, and there are specific attributes to the hormone of testosterone. There are specific things that it brings up. There are certain drives that it awakens, in any body, not just the masculine body, right? It could be the body of somebody that is getting injected with testosterone. There's something that it does. And that something, as beautiful as it is, can also get, it has a, it has a dangerous edge to it when it doesn't come with maturity, when it doesn't come with formation. Right? They say that all of us take up to the, about the age of 25 for our brains to be fully formed, right? They say most of the men in jail have, are in there for crimes committed between 16 and 25. That's like a really interesting thing to notice, right? I mean, I wanna be clear, I'm not in any way endorsing the prison industrial complex, but what I am saying is that there's a pattern there that, that merits our attention. And I'm also saying that we are among the first people, we're among the first people to stop paying attention or remembering or even worshiping our ancestors, right? Somehow we're born into a culture as if we came out of nowhere to create ourselves. And if we have any ancestors, they are within the next the last two or 250 years of history that we remember if at all, from the history books that are warped as they are. And my belief is that we are the first people to steal actively from the future because we're also the first people to forget our ancestors. We forget our ancestors and we forget our descendants. And why am I bringing our ancestors into a conversation about conscious masculinity? Because ancestral practices always included initiation rituals. And initiation rituals were how you shape the, the boys and the girls of the culture, right, into what belonging means, into what right action means. And initiation rituals in ancestral cultures, in, a, in original cultures, knew how to contend with this flood of hormonal energy, right, that begins to shape boys. They knew what to do with it. They knew how to channel it. They knew how to protect the tribe from it, how to make it a good thing. And so we want to ask ourselves, what is there that we have forgotten? I spoke about our work as a forward-facing remembering, right? We're looking into a future that is in danger, but we're remembering, right? We're remembering what we have forgotten in order to move into that future. And that's part of this project of making men conscious. Because the very thing that threatens our future is a, is a logic of extraction and accumulation that is fundamentally patriarchal in nature. Right? We treat earth right, like we treat our women. That is part of what is happening. We take, we extract. Right? And so this process of becoming conscious, this process of forward-facing remembering is a way to contend with the, the very threat to the species that a patriarchal mindset has set in motion. Now, I started doing this work, as I said, because it's the work of atonement for me. But I also started to do it because it became clear that we have a very good definition of what toxic masculinity is. 
we know what rape culture looks like. We know what domination feels like. We know what bluster, right? And fronting are. We know that, we see it. We can recognize it. We get annoyed by it. We get bothered by it. And so what we don't have is a definition of conscious masculinity. So what does that mean? That means that if you're a good guy or if you want to be a good guy, if you want to be a conscious guy, the best way for you to deal with your masculinity, since we don't have a definition of conscious masculinity, you become afraid of your masculinity. You think of it as toxic and all you do is you turn it down, right? You kind of take your masculinity and you turn it down a couple of notches and that becomes the only option that you have. And you misunderstand that by doing that, what you're actually doing is depriving yourself depriving your community, depriving your partners of an energy, of a way of being that is not only good, but necessary. Right? And so what we're saying is that masculinity in itself, itself is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, right? Toxic masculinity is, and that masculinity and patriarchy get woven together as if they're the same thing, but they're not. I myself, in the process of trying to become a better man, went through that process of trying to suppress what is masculine about me, right? Because I thought that patriarchy was the problem, that masculinity was the problem. And so I started to suppress that, but you know what happens when you suppress something? And it was a great coach, a relationship coach that taught me this. Um, you take a beach ball and you put it underwater in the pool and what happens? It's gonna come out sideways, right? It just gonna, it's gonna come out anyway. Right? And so you take what this idea of like just suppressing the masculinity is sending us, our men and our boys, in the wrong direction. What does that look like? Well, it looks like many things. What it looks like is a whole lot of sexless coupledom, right? And I'm not gonna, you don't have to wait, you don't have to wave your hand, right? You don't have to accept it, but how many married couples here in cis hetero relationships? It's been a couple of years. Ask yourself how much sex is going on. You know why? Because what happens is you don't have a polarity. You don't have a play, an erotic play of masculine and feminine, and feminine dancing because the only way, right, to be a good guy is to turn your masculinity down. The other thing that you have is an insane, an insane uh, epidemic of porn addiction. And I'm not coming out uh, here with like, any moralist anti-porn perspective. I'm a sex positive person, right? But when all of your sexuality is experienced through a screen, there's something happening to both men and women, but especially to men that is rewiring, right? And it's you're just kind of hiding and taking this urge and putting it in a corner somewhere. And so you start, you keep getting this tamp down, Excuse me. I had a question. It's in relation to what was stated. I'm sorry. Oh, my name is Donna Archer. I'm a little late for the conference, but I caught up to what you were saying. Um, oh, no, no, no. Like excuse me. Donna. Excuse me. Excuse me. We're, He's in the middle of a keynote, so we'll come to questions at a different time. Okay. Oh, so, so no questions are asked right now? No, thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry, you're wrong. You're wrong. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to... No problem. I, I appreciate the concern. Um, the other thing that happens is men want to be men anyway. And so if you look at things like the proud boys, right, it's a warped way of expressing your manhood, right? And so what you have is what I, I recently uh, read as defined as an ornamental masculinity, an ornamental masculinity where you're kind of playing out the tropes of masculinity, but it is empty. Right? It is empty. It's not getting you anywhere. The current occupant of the White House is a perfect example of that kind of ornamental masculinity, right? It's empty. There's nothing behind it. There's only bluster. It's only image. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how then you become conscious. So what I did is I interviewed men to, do, to work on the Better Men Project and a couple of things were clear. 
men didn't feel like we have full access to the range of human emotion. So you know how to be sad, afraid, and angry. That's what you know, right? You don't have the, and you don't have authentic relationships with other men. You don't have authentic relationships with other men. So you don't have full access to human emotion and you don't have authentic relationships with other men. What does that mean? That means that the woman in your life or the woman in your life is single, the one woman in your life is the one that has to bear your emotional labor, right? Because you're not contending with your masculinity among other men where it needs to be contended with. There's one person, maybe two, that are dealing with it. So you don't have authentic relationships because there's a lot of posturing in what it takes to be a male friend, right? There's a lot of hiding in it and you don't have access to the full range of human emotion. What I also have been doing is asking women, what advice, strong women, what advice do they have for men? Well, one of the things that they have is the first one, I'm most clear is stop hurting us. Stop hurting us. That seems like pretty clear advice, right? Like start there, stop causing harm. But the other one that comes up over and over again is do your work. You know, do your work. Find, do your emotional work. Find out who you are. Get to know yourself. Get to know yourself. Now, none of us, men, women, any gender, none of us get to do our quote unquote work by ourselves. It always has to be done in community. And again, this work, and remember, I was talking about the men that I work with, we tend to be as cisgender men that identify as masculine, needs to be done in the company of other men. I'm going to finish with a thought here, uh, just looking at the time, which is there's a couple of attributes to the conscious masculine. And now I'm talking about the masculine energy that is true in all of us. You could be a man, you could be a woman, you could be anything in between, right? There's a way, there's a certain masculine energy that you can work with. And it has a couple of attributes. First of all, it is oriented towards purpose, right? It has to orient towards something greater than itself, right? When um, when masculine energy is stuck in self-centeredness, it becomes narcissistic, it becomes extractive, and it becomes hurtful. So it must orient itself towards a cause that is greater than itself. That is a key aspect of masculine energy. Masculine energy has, is anchored in purpose. It is grounded or seeks to ground. So it, it, it has an energy that moves towards the earth and it has the capacity of holding right? Whether it is holding a child, right? Whether it is holding the partner, whether it is holding a circle or a space, it has the capacity to hold. And it alternates, depending on what is needed, between serving and protecting. So serving does not have to be subservient, right? Serving means to be in service of, to be in service of. And protecting is when it comes down to it, you're willing to put your own self and body at risk for sake of that greater thing that will outlive you. Those are some of the things I've been learning on my journey of conscious masculinity. Thank you uh, for the time.